path instead of the pet detective. We have. And the thing I like about this is it talks about to analyze and protect your data. And one thing that's, I guess I didn't realize, you know, I'd always worked at companies where you have everything in your own IT space and firewalls and whatever, you know, so you didn't really have to worry about data protection as much as you do, like when you work in, as either an independent consultant or like in the advanced analytics lab. Um, you know, we worked on healthcare data sometimes, you know, with insurance, we would get medical bills and things like that, so you have to understand the HIPAA laws, and um, we worked sometimes with tax data, so we had to understand the IRS rules, and so you, we actually had to go to a lot of training and sign a lot of papers that we would not do bad things with data. And so anytime you're going to work with customers, you know, their data is going to be really important to, it, to them and they don't want it out in any way. So in addition to analyzing data, there is a lot of um, emphasis on protecting the data as well. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, hopefully you have, but this is kind of um, like the maturity curve for analytics. So a lot of companies say they have analytics, but really they're just doing static reports. And that's the way most companies start out. And there's still, even in companies that are further up the curve, there's still a lot of need to do static reporting. Um, once you get past static reporting, then you have drill downs, you know, so you can look at big numbers and drill down to get more details. And then ad hoc reports uh, where you can quickly uh, create reports. And you'll see a lot of software companies and SaaS is really getting big into this with visual analytics coming up with new tools to do ad hoc reports quickly. Um, the more advanced analytics um, is forecasting, predictive modeling, and optimization. And in the advanced analytics lab, even though we had some of the uh, ad hoc reports and drill downs, really our value was being able to provide forecasting and predictive modeling to our customers. Okay, so the three projects that I'm going to talk about that I worked on is the first one was product reliability. I had a um, very large customer who made vehicles, like very expensive vehicles with very expensive parts. And um, they also, these vehicles lived for a long time. You know, it was not like your car where it's five years and get a new one. It was more like 25 years or 30 years and get a new one, but, and they were very expensive, so the parts were very expensive, and they had maintenance contracts, and they needed to be able to predict when they needed to replace parts, and how much it was going to cost, and things like that. So I worked on that project. The other project, I, I'm going to, and I have some more slides on that, the other project I want to talk about, and maybe you saw it, um, it's actually on the front page of the NNO. Um, I worked with the Wake County EMS team to analyze the cardiac arrest data. So when I get my performance review this year, I just bring in the newspaper <laughs> and say, this is me. <laughs> so, um, so I worked on that project, and I have some slides on that as well. And then I have a couple of things to talk about the transition to anti-money laundering. Okay, so um, when I worked on the reliability project, the customer had a few goals in mind. Um, one of the things that they wanted to do is, is, you know, their data was a mess, and they had lots of engineers spending lots of time collecting data from a bunch of different data sources, combining them into Excel spreadsheets, manually going through and cleaning the data, and then trying to do some modeling with it. Um, so it was a, a lot of time to get turnaround on stuff, and it was also, you know, a lot of um, just data gathering by engineers who, you know, had engineering degrees and didn't really go to school to collect data. And they also, because they, um, you know, were doing all this stuff manually, it was very error prone. And they had different ways of doing it. So two, if you talk to two different engineers, they wouldn't necessarily do the same task the same way. 
So that was one of their goals, is to be able to do it more quickly and then by automation and then also to be able to take those engineers who were spending all their time making reports about what failed and assign them to figuring out why it failed <laughs> so it won't fail again. Um, they also had a lot of issues when they would have these, they would have contract margin reviews. So they would predict for every customer how much their maintenance agreement is going to cost for the lifetime of this vehicle. And when they did that, they would have, you know, they would give numbers and then the next year they would compare the numbers they give last year to the numbers they got this year and they would see, wow, you know, last year we predicted $100,000 more than we predicted this year and it was just all over the map. So they wanted to be more, um, they wanted to be more consistent with their predictions. <coughs> And then the last thing is they wanted to be able to use this information to figure out, okay, you know, we see that we have a lot of failures on these parts, but we only see them failing at these service shops, or we only see them failing when they come from this vendor. So they wanted to be able to take the data and be able to find the root cause of the failures and try to improve that so they weren't using as many parts in the long run. So we actually had a pretty big project at first, and what we did was, first of all, we had to collect all of their data sources and bring them in-house. And um, the next thing we needed to do is some data cleaning. And in this case, we actually needed to do some analytical data cleaning. Because one of the things that happened is with these vehicles is when they would go into a service shop, like what they would um, take off you know, a panel and they would lose power to the vehicle. And so they would get this bottom line, or this, yeah, it would drop out. And then the person at the service shop was responsible for saying, okay, well, you know, we came in at 600,000 miles, we took off the town and it dropped, and even set it back to 600,000 miles. And so what they had was the blue line, and using an analyt analytical data cleaning algorithm, we were able to create the red line. I think that's what color it is on this. <laughs> I think the line. So, um, and this one, you know, it doesn't look so bad because they're using this to predict, you know, the rate at which parts fail. They're looking at how many miles do you go until it fails. So these weren't too hard because they usually drop down and pick back up. But we found some cases where people would forget to reset it. And so, um, you know, we used really basic algebra, slope of the line kind of algorithms to clean this data. And what was happening before is they had one person for every customer who was responsible for manually cleaning this data. And so we created this algorithm and then I would go around to, and work with the people at the different shops and we would compare our results, you know, to what the algorithm said and what they had last time. And in most cases, you know, we found doing that and testing, we found a few problems with the algorithm, but we found about 20 to 30 times more problems where they had manually cleaned it. So now they at least have consistent data um, across all their vehicles to figure out, to predict, you know, how many miles it's going to be until it fails. Okay, the next thing we did, and is with our automation we created a um, cost tracking chart and so what we were looking over the last year what we predicted so that's what the gray lines are that's what we predicted it would be and then we can see the blue lines were our actual <coughs> values and then we calculated rates and stuff so these are all part of their contract margin review that they would present to their customer and to their business people and then we, based on the data that we had and the mileage data that we had, we would forecast. And you can see these vehicles, like this is a fleet of vehicles. And so this, as it tapers down, you can see they basically have less and less vehicles in their fleet over time. So, but this is an example of, you know, like, after the analytics, how you present the information is really, really important, you know. So, um, being able to come up with ways to present it that your customers understand 
And what, not so much in this group, because when I worked with this group, they already had a lot of these things in place. And their company, it was a really big company, and they had a lot of processes that had to be approved and go through committees and blah, blah, blah. So they actually didn't want a lot of new and different stuff because it was very formal. Uh, when I worked with the Wake County guys, they were much more, you know, you would, they would see their data and they'd be like, oh, show it to me like this, show it to me like that, you know. So they were much more interactive with what they wanted to see or, you know, giving ideas. And then we also were able to look at the data visually. So this is um, just a plot of where some of the failures happened uh, of these vehicles. So, um, all right, any questions on that? Or we'll go to the cardiac arrest. <laughs> okay. All right, the cardiac arrest data. I tell you, first of all, we are all lucky to be in Wake County because they actually have one of the premier EMS groups in the country and um, if you don't if you want to know more about it you can go to their web page they have a lot of information on it but um, I mean they're really considered one of the best EMS places in the country and when I did some of this data analysis I compared it to like the US results and you if you're gonna have a heart attack you want to have it in White County I can tell you <laughs> because, because their results like it's very depressing what the you know what the numbers are as far as success, but theirs are significantly better than everybody else. So um, and they're I mean they're they're very impressive people and they really have a passion for what they do. So I think the world of those guys. And um, they actually when I first started working on this project, you know, they give me like papers to read from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly. <laughs> Me, I'm going, oh my gosh, this is what people read. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, and, and I had to get used to them, you know, being doctors talking about, oh, well, you know, we're not concerned whether they're just dead. We want to know if they're dead or dead, dead. And I'm like, well, what's dead, dead? <laughs> it's like, okay, they're either, you know, really dead, dead, or they're, you know, we finally agreed that they're not neurologically intact because <laughs> but you can imagine <laughs> what that really means. But um, I actually had to end up uh, going and flipping all the variables because they had, you know, like a dead And I'm like, no, I'm not, I want to model survival. <laughs> I want to model. <laughs> so let's have a survive variable. Yes, they survived. <laughs> so, but uh, one of the interesting things about the White County is project is they actually thought, boy, they had the cleanest data. They thought, you know, we've spent a lot of time with our data and we clean it and it's really good and, you know, we've described exactly what we want. And I spent probably out of the eight month projects, the first six months going back and forth on cleaning their data. And, um, and that's what you'll find is one of the biggest challenges is having clean data and then also being able to agree on what you do if you have no way to clean it. Um, you know, so you do lots of, I mean, just little things, especially when you have text entry. So like they had text entry for, um, you know, for like race. And so you had all kinds of, you know, it's like you had white, you had Caucasian, you had to learn that you put them together. And, and then there's a lot of I don't know if you call it industry standards, but medical standards on how when you do studies, how you categorize people and their categories didn't match those categories. So we had to agree where we put the Asian Pacific people and things like that. So there was a lot of problems with um, you know, textual data, but then the other thing that was a big challenge is what they were actually modeling was the length of resuscitation. So they were trying to decide, um, I guess about 20 years ago, the guideline was when you're doing CPR on somebody, you know, after 20 minutes, it's kind of a waste of time. But over that, the course of the last 20 years, they've made a lot of improvements in other aspects of CPR. The biggest thing probably being uh, induced hypothermia. And based on that, they've seen, you know, based on their experience that that's not necessarily true. So that's what we were trying to look at is based on the data, 
is that 20 minutes still good or should the guidelines be changed? Um, okay, so, um, and actually when they changed the guidelines over the past, I think it was like since 2005, they did a really good job as far as, you know, really almost designing an experiment for it because what they did is they had, you know, three or four different things that they wanted to implement and they implemented them in phases and they collected data in each of those phases and then they could go back and look compared to the phase before did this really help or not help. So what we wanted to do is um, figure out the length of resuscitation that people were still neurologically intact. And you know, so the biggest challenge we had besides cleaning the data is defining length of resuscitation based on what data they actually had. You know, so we had to look at all the time variables they had, and we ended up with a pretty complicated algorithm <laughs> that said, you know, if we have this time variable, then you know we'll use that, and if not, we'll use this other one, or if this is a flag in this database, then we'll use that variable um, to come up with the length of resuscitation. And we found lots of interesting problems with the time data, and luckily, you know, there were only about 7,000 records, so you could actually look at it with your eyes if you had to. But, you know, we found things that um, when people got called in at like a quarter till 12, like at midnight or something <coughs> sometimes, you know, the date wouldn't change when it went to one o'clock and so it looked like it was like a day and a half that they were being worked on. And we found things like, um, we found a couple of records that had issues because it was the day daylight savings time changed. And so, you know, there was a gap in the date or, you know, they finished CPR before they started. Or, you know, you know. So it was a really interesting process to go through, you know, all this data and try to figure out how we were going to um, implement it. And they actually took a lot of our um, cleaning algorithms and implemented it on their side so that they can continually you know, do studies and not have to have this huge um, cleaning effort. So some of the things that we looked up at, you know, the first thing we looked at was just has the survival rate increased over time? And you can see for the most part it had. And when you do this, you can't just look at your eyes and say, yeah, it's going up. It's good. You have to see, is it really a statistical difference? So to do that, you you know we looked at different um, chi-square tests, and so we were looking for a probability um, of less than 0.05 to decide if it was statistically different, significant you know, change. And we agreed that yes, it is going up, and yes, over time statistically it is also truly going up. Um, then when you look by phase, it's a little more drastic. And you can see the phase two to three is where they actually put in the induced hypothermia. So that was a really a huge um, thing. And when we looked at that, we, we had to, um, when we did our data cleaning, we, we had to decide, you know, like if somebody had a heart attack because they fell into a cold lake, <laughs> then you don't need to induce hypothermia, but they're already hypothermic so you know how to classify those so those are all the kinds of decisions and you know when you talk to data scientists they'll always talk about the SME the subject matter expert and that's something that you know you really need on every project is somebody who really understands the data and the subject matter that you can ask questions and a lot of times they won't like the Wake County guys they had a specific question they wanted to answer but a lot of times your customers don't have a specific question. They just say, you know, I have data and I know there's something important in here for me to know and can you help me find it? You know, so, um, you know, what, if you're lucky, you have a customer that really wants, knows what they want. If not, you know, the first thing you do is start making some graphs, um, you know, to kind of look at the data in different ways and then have those discussions with them and then you'll start being able to pull out ideas of what might be interesting to them. 
Excuse me. Mm -hmm. The face. Uh, what are the faces? I mean, you have uh, what is the survival rate here? And then phase one and two. Where is phase three? Well, okay, these were where they implemented new um, routines. Routines. Oh, yeah. So phase one was like the way we did it 20 years ago. Phase two, I forget what they added. It was something with the um, breathing. And then phase three, they started introducing hypothermia. And then phase four, they I forget what they did in phase four. But yeah, it was like they, they were just improving the processes. Yeah. So um, the next thing we wanted to do is look at, like we looked at both survival and then also neurologically intact survival. So we actually, for every, we had two, um, two variables that we were modeling. One was whether they just survived or not survived, and the other one was whether they survived and were neurologically intact. And, and they actually have a code for that, like there's a series of, one, two, three, and four, and if they're, um, we, for neurologically intact, we, I think it was one of the twos that we kept, so basically they could function on their own, so they didn't need assistance, or, you know, they might not be the same level of functioning as they were before the cardiac arrest, but, you know, they didn't need assistance in the home or anything like that, so that's what we looked at for neurologically intact. And um, so we can see, and then the other thing we did is, you know, when we when we came up with um, values that were outside of two hours, we, we just, you know, we had a discussion, do we just want to throw out those observations, or do we want to keep them and truncate them, and so we agreed to keep them and truncate them. I think since I made this one, we, we've gone back and uh, found like one of these was the daylight savings time issue and so that brought it back in and then I forget what the other one was. Um, but anyway, so as you can see if you look at the the length of resuscitation in minutes across the bottom, you can see it managed they quit at 20. <laughs> There's a lot of people who <laughs> would have lost maybe. So um, I mean this has been a pretty big thing for them and they presented at, at some emergency medical conference and um, they won a prize for like one of the most, I don't know, whatever they won prizes for. <laughs> and then they've actually found um, a study in uh, Singapore that is cons has consistent results so they're working on trying to get it published in like the New England Medicine Medical Journal, which is kind of cool. But um, anyway, so the important thing was you know, based on their data, even if you didn't look at anything else, you can see a lot of people lived a lot longer than that. And then this chart up here, I think it's kind of cool because it kind of shows you, like the, the line across the top are all the instances where people survived. And then, unfortunately, the dark line across the bottom is where they didn't. But it kind of shows you the probability of survival over time with the confidence interval. And, you know, it's not like you're... Um, you know, trying to decide whether to bet on a horse or not. You know, this is like a people's lives. So even if the probabilities, you know, lower than fifty percent here, it's still worth working for. So, so they actually, you know, have changed their guidelines now locally on um, and and trained the EMS techs on on this information so that they ignore those guidelines. The old guidelines. And then this is another way, and, and this was an example of talking to my subject matter experts or to my customers. This is something that they wanted to see. And you know, to me, there's just a lot of big words and stuff because I just care about the numbers. But um, you know, they they immediately, like the first thing that EMS people do is they, you know, take pulse or whatever they do and they just hook up their machines and they know what kind of heart failure it is. And based on the different types of heart failure, um, you can see that, you know, like if it's 
ACEs, that the probability of survival is a lot lower, but this helps give them guidelines as well. Because a lot of times, and I didn't realize this, but the two, to the, the two doctors that I work with the most, um, they're actually kind of rotate on call with the EMS guys. So when the EMS guys are working on somebody and they, you know, have a question, they can like pick up their phone and call an emergency medical physician um, in Wake County, and they do that. And it was funny because even we had they came over for lunch at SAS one day, and we were presenting some of the preliminary results, and you know they were all excited because they had had a case the day before that was. Um, they used some of this information and then had shown that, yeah, this was a good thing and we've learned a lot. So, um, you know, and the one doctor's like, yeah, I'm going to take this little chart and laminate it and keep it in my pocket. But, um, you know, so there's a lot of value that came out of just like crunching the numbers. Okay, so that was probably the most exciting thing. Yeah. Do you find that DNRs skew the data in any way? Now, well, this was uh, out of the hospital cardiac arrest, so they don't really have that information. Um, right? So the EMS don't really know that. So they go, they pick it up. They go to somebody's house and the spouse is there. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So, um, and really, they. I mean, one of the things that's good about Wake County doing this study is they're, as, as they say, they're, they're big enough to have a lot of good data, but they're small enough to be able to, you know, go the extra step in trying to get information. So when we got the data, you know, they had gone and pulled hospital records to see what happened, you know, like their data goes to when they drop them off at the emergency room, but they had gone back and collected as much information as they could from the hospitals to try to get the final outcomes as well. And then the other thing, you know, there was a lot of other things we looked at, like this was the main thing they wanted to look at, but we also looked at things like, like we know if there was um, somebody on the scene or if the EMS guy was the first responder, and you know, we knew a lot of times, like, if it was at a medical facility, so was it somebody with medical training, or was it um, the fire department was the first one on the scene, or was it somebody's family, and, you know, things like that. So, you know, definitely we looked at a lot of other aspects of this data and found, found some interesting information as far as, you know, the possible, well, we looked at like what variables were most predictive of survivability, and a lot of it was, you know, was there a first responder who had some kind of training, and you know, there were there was about six or seven variables that really seemed to impact it um, that we looked at, and and that was consistent with other studies that we had seen. Um, and then we just did some stuff just to, for the heck of it, like looking at what, um, at the different um, ambulances or and figuring out, you know, who had different, who had the most responses to different kinds of events, which was kind of interesting. And, and a lot of it confirmed things that they thought they knew. You know, like when I showed the graphs of the ambulances, oh, they're like, oh, yeah, well, that's next to this senior citizen's home. <laughs> you know, it's only however far away, and that's why we see a lot more of those. But a lot of it was um, confirmed what they knew or, you know, gave credibility to what they thought, but there were also some new information um, that they came out with it. <laughs> is, this, is there any chance this is going to be rolled out to other counties? Yeah, they uh, they actually have presented at the emergency medical physicians thing, and they've actually they've also like presented it globally. And I and, and the the Dr. Myers, who's in charge of the EMS here, he's very progressive, forward thinking. And I mean, even like New York City comes to him and asks for advice, and he's like pretty good at he's very good at sharing. The information and making sure that everybody else has it. So I'm sure he's already he's already been to Australia talking about it. So I hopefully he's been to the other 
uh, places in North Carolina. There, the, the, the patients who had a paramedic arrive at the scene first, do they show a higher survival rate than those who did not? Um, it was more, and I'm trying to remember because it's been about a year and a half since I did this, but it was more that if there was somebody who was trained, you know, so if it, it could have been a fireman showed up first or it could have been a family member who knew what they were doing. But yeah, I mean, getting to somebody quickly was, was an important factor. So. All right. Okay. So after working on, I worked on these. The I worked on the um, big, the reliability thing for about two and a half years. I worked for, on the EMS for about six months on and off, and then I worked on a few other like fraud projects, insurance fraud, and things like that in the advanced analytics lab. And um, you know, after working as an analyst for two or three years, well, three three and a half years. Um, I decided, you know, I, I missed some of the structure of software development um, and I decided to move back into more of a software development role. So I moved into an organization where I could combine my software background with my analytics background and start in implementing analytics in one of the products that SAS develops. So now I work in an anti-money laundering um, organization. So we build software for anti-money laundering. And like the US government actually has a lot of regulations with regards to what banks must look for with regards to both money laundering and terrorist financing. And then the banks, if they find these things happening, they have to file reports to the government. And big banks, you know, like Citibank or Wachovia, which is now Wells Fargo, like or Bank of America, a lot of those banks actually have you know their own analytics groups that do a lot of this stuff. But these requirements are even for you know credit unions or you know now that Walmart's like doing wire transfers and all this kind of stuff, these guys all have to follow these rules and regulations. And even foreign banks who do a lot of work with the U.S. have to um, follow a lot of these regulations. So we have a tool that we call AML for anti-money laundering. And it does, it looks through records for things that have been predictive of money laundering in the past. So if there's a lot of wire transfers over you know, $10,000 or if a person um, is like going from ATM to ATM to ATM, you know, deposit withdrawal, deposit withdrawal. So there's a lot of, we call them scenarios that have been predictive of money laundering. And we have a tool that allows the banks to put their data in our data model. Um, you know, we have transaction data. We have account data um, and uh, information about the customers and things like that. They load their data in our data model and then we run our scenarios. And then if we see things that we think are predictive of anti-money laundering, then we generate an alert and it goes to a user at the bank who can look at that alert and drill down on information and investigate it and then based on their investigation decide whether to file a report with the government or not. So, um, you know, as things are, as, as our tools get more sophisticated, so do the money launderers. <laughs> it's like all these people who do bad things seem to stay a step ahead of everybody else. They come up with new ways to do bad things. But, um, and we do our best to try to catch them. So some of the things that we look for when we do money laundering is we, you know, we actually have to kind of, you know, you can't apply the same rules to every single customer of a bank because banks have different customers. They have individual customers like you or me. They have um, corporate customers. They might have government customers. And then even individual customers, you know, it's like a college student right out of school with their first job is going to have a different profile of the way they spend their money than 
somebody who's you know closer to retirement or you know somebody who just won the lottery yesterday <laughs> so um, you know we we have to look at all their accounts and we decide how to break them up based on both similar um, account types or similar how they transact you know how much money they spend every month versus how much money they deposit every month so we try to go through their um, customers and and group them together like like accounts together because when we create these you know rules it's like you know to me if i write a ten thousand dollar check you know that's a pretty big deal i'm buying a car or putting a down payment on our house or you know it's like a life event that doesn't happen very often <laughs> Whereas, you know, Dr. Goodnight, that might be like his weekly, you know, <laughs> dining bill or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, we have to figure out based on your spending habits, based on how much money you put in, take out every month, how to group them so that we can customize our scenario for that type of customer. Because, you know, when we do wire transfers for you know, a kid out of college, maybe if they even did a wire transfer, that's a big deal. Um, and we want to look at this customer and why they did it. But there's going to be other types of customers that do that frequently. Uh, we also have things like, um, like you can get watch lists of bad people globally from um, Dow Jones or from other sources. And so we also, you know, compare your customers to watch these watch lists, people on the watch list, and um, decide, you know, if your customers are doing bad things. So these are just some of the things that we look at um, to decide how to group them. You know, we look at your total transactions. We look at um, your total volumes and we group them and then use this to customize our scenarios. So this might be an example of, um, or this is an example of how you might segment your customers. So you might have personal customers and you might break them up into people that, you know, only have checking accounts, people that have retirement accounts, people who have accounts but they don't do much, you know. Um, Sometimes you open an account on a bank because you live there for three months and then you forget about it and it sits there with 25 bucks in until they deduct it at zero. <laughs> um, commercial, you know, we look at different aspects of it. And, you know, so sometimes you might group it, you might start out grouping it by like whatever the bank uh, calls your account, you know, your gold card account or your just a minimum checking account or whatever. And then we would customize all our scenarios based on the groups. And then, you know, after a while you have to go back and you have to look and see how well you're catching people. So you find the alerts go to your investigators and your investigators either say, yep, yeah, this is a bad person, I'm gonna forward it on, or I didn't see anything um, bad about it, so I'm gonna say it's fine. And then we would go back and we would, you know, compare our predictions to what actually happened and then retune. Um, our products. So, so those are the kinds of things I've been working on uh, in my like almost four years as a data scientist. And you know, I I think some of the best things about it is you can tell that those projects were all pretty diverse. So you know, you can work on a lot of different aspects. I think some people, you know. When I went to graduate school, some people loved finance and all they wanted to do is get out and be a financial analyst or do data analytics in a financial role. Some people loved marketing and they wanted to do marketing analytics and figure out how to sell you Pepsi and you Coke and, you know. <laughs> and then some people like variety, so they go into more of a consulting role. But I think that's one of the... the nice things about it is it opens up a lot of doors in a lot of different directions and based on um, you know your background then you know you can use it to get in those doors hopefully. <laughs> um, you know I, I, I know I work with people who do who are more you know have like more artist background like actually you know have design degrees and now they're analysts 
and they tend to migrate towards more text analytics because it's not as numerical, it's more looking for patterns and text and things like that. So I think, you know, it's a big field with a lot of opportunity right now. And um, it's fun. So <laughs> does anybody have any questions? How tough was the process to get into state's uh, master's program for network? Well, when I got in, it wasn't as bad as it is now, because I know now, I think last year, they had 800 applicants, and they interviewed like 200 for 80 or 90 positions. So when I got in, it wasn't nearly as competitive as it is now. So, but yeah. But I think, I don't know. I think it, as more schools are starting to offer um, the program, and even a lot are starting to offer online, I think it's going to kind of level out as far as competitiveness. So, yeah, you know, when you're the only one in the country, it's a little, <laughs> and your graduation rate and your hiring rate, you know, and if you've ever looked at their website, they really boast their their hiring rate and the starting salaries and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and you know, they're, they're very fortunate in that it was, um, you know, well, they had a lot of help from SAS. I mean, a lot of the instructors I had were from SAS and, um, you know, we got a lot of SAS certifications, which was great. Um, I think that it'll get less competitive too because they're like the price is going up quite a bit every year. <laughs> I think it's double what when it, what it was when I went. Um, but you know, it is worth it, the money because if you look at what it would take if you had to go to SAS and pay for the same courses, you know, as an independent person and even the exams, it's like just the SAS courses and the exams alone probably cost more than the program. Um, and you know, I, I can tell you, it was a very good program. They did a very good job of exposing you to all kinds of tools, even you know, non-SAS tools. And I know when I started in the advanced analytics lab, there were things that I got to do because I had had exposure to tools that my customer was currently using. You know, and most you know most of the people at SAS know all the SAS tools, but we'd also uh, learned other tools, and our customer had some of their own tools written in other products, and I was able to you know talk to them and understand what they were doing and how to take what they were doing and and migrate it to SAS. So, and they also did a good job with um, they have a practicum. And my practicum, I actually worked with the bank, and we did a model for a home equity line of credit. So we had like real bank data, and um, you know, they had a VP that was kind of our supervisor, and we actually had to clean the data, build a model, present the results. Like we really worked at a bank, and you know, there were all kinds of uh, different projects like that. So, yes. When you're on a large product project and and it's kind of broken into who's leading it and the different levels, like what are some of the things that are more interesting for people to do? Is it like the, a lot of data cleaning and such? Or yeah. Or? Um, like on our projects, we at, at SAS, we tended to have, in the advanced analytics lab, we tended to have a few different roles. We usually had um, an ETL person. And that was the person who would work with the customer on getting their data and getting it and loading the databases. And then we might have another ETL person or an analyst that did data cleaning. And then there is usually always uh, call a BI person, a business intelligence person, that does all the reports, you know, and automates the reporting that the customer is interested in. And then, you know, depending on the size of the project, there might be a lead analyst and the team, you know, a small team of analysts or, you know, smaller projects that might only be one analyst. So, and then there's always a project manager who usually is the person who does the main interface with the customer. We have an online question from Christine Rizzo. 
for the anti-money uh, money laundering project, how many profiles do you work with? Our tool is, like, we're working on the tool, so what we do is we leave it up to the customer. It's configurable. So um, we have teams of consultants that will go through and work with the customer, or the customer can, um, you know, we have a data model that they fill it out. So it depends on we let the customer choose. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys for being so patient. And <laughs> Another session on Tuesday, March 3rd, and same time, same place. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah.